That's Iranian MPs chanting death to America in the capital of Tehran. The regime is threatening harsh retaliation after the U.S. killed its most powerful general. His death marks a significant escalation between Iran and America. And Donald Trump ramped up the rhetoric on Twitter, writing in caps that Iran would be, quote, hit very fast and very hard if they retaliate. And right now, about 3,000 American troops are on their way to the Middle East as reinforcements. One thing is for sure, any war with Iran will not look like the Iraq War. In 2003, the U.S. invasion began with a, quote, shock and awe campaign designed to destroy Iraq's defenses with big bombs and overwhelming firepower. But now the world is preparing for a very different type of war. This is not Iraq. Uh, this is not Panama. This is something much, much more dangerous. More dangerous. What does that mean? Well, it isn't just New York's mayor who is concerned about this. Other U.S. cities, including Los Angeles, also issued alerts telling residents to be vigilant. One of the ways Iran could retaliate is a full-scale cyber war. Former NATO Supreme Allied Commander Admiral James Stavridis, who's actually been on this program, says it's what he worries about the most, and it's been building since 2007 when it's widely accepted that the U.S. launched a massive cyber attack on Iran's nuclear program, fearing it was trying to build nuclear weapons. This footage is from the documentary Zero Days. Security experts say that attack changed things forever. Somebody just used a new weapon, and this weapon will not be put back into the box. Hmm. Almost immediately, Iran started building its own cyber warfare tools, and it says it's now created the fourth largest cyber army in the world, just behind Russia, China, and, of course, the United States. And it's been flexing those muscles ever since with attacks on banks, casinos, and even power grids. Just last year, U.S. President Trump threatened Iran, saying, we are no longer a country that will stand for your demented words of violence and death. And Soleimani, the, the man just killed, responded saying, we are near you where you can't even imagine. We are ready. Of course, the U.S. has a massive cyber toolkit too. And according to the New York Times, it developed its own cyber plan called NitroZeus to shut down Tehran and other Iranian cities in the event of a war. We know that cyber attacks are able to black out entire cities, cripple banks, freeze ATMs, shut down oil refineries, paralyze airports and hospitals, because all of those things carried out by various suspects have already happened. Joining me now is Besma Momani. She's a professor at the University of Waterloo and a specialist on the Middle East. Also with us from Washington is Kirsten Todd. She is an expert on cybersecurity who advised U.S. President Barack Obama on cyber. So, hello to you both. Best I'll come to you in just a moment. But, Kirsten, I want to start with you. Uh, a lot of American intelligence experts are very worried about the possibility of a, of a cyber attack from Iran. Are you? Well, I think we can certainly expect um, that we'll have retaliation from Iran. Uh, we, it's important to note that Soleimani wasn't just uh, the second most important person in Iran, but he was an iconic figure, uh, not just military, not just political, but his face is on souvenirs and museums uh, in the country. So there is going to be retaliation. And Iran has two things right now. They have both capability and they have intent. They're certainly motivated by the death of this iconic figure to do harm uh, to the United States, either in the region or on our homeland. Besma, how worried are you? Like, how worried should people be about Iran? How strong is their cyber capability? Well, there's mixed reports about sort of how strong they are. Uh, certainly, they've claimed to be very strong. The challenge with cyber always is that uh, most countries don't take claim for it. They don't actually admit that they've done attacks. And even Iran in the past, whether it's the casino, uh, the Sands Casino, whether it's uh, in the case of Russia and Ukraine and, and the Sandstorm, uh, we've seen that, in fact, they've tended to not necessarily take claim for it. So we're not sure. Uh, there is some reports by The Guardian, for example, that at one point they had 100,000 cyber warriors 
years, I do think they have the capability, and, and we can see from the research and technology side of things, uh, they're really quite competent. Uh, of course, as, as Kirsten noted, they have the intent and they have the motivation now, which is really sort of the important point of this all. Uh, but they'll want to stay below the threshold of, deni of, of culpable deniability. I mean, that's really the way the Iranians work. Uh, they may have the intent to attack the United States, and invariably that affects us. Uh, but it will really be something that is not going to be easily identified as Iranian, so that, in fact, in the court of opinion, the court of international law, they're frankly not going to be responded to in like. We've, we've heard a number of former intelligence officials in the U.S., one in particular, uh, Kirsten, saying that uh, what worries him most is the cyber equivalent of a weapon of mass destruction. What are we talking about here? We know when wars, people get killed. In cyber, are, are we just talking about taking up military installations, or are we talking about things that affect civilians as well? So the, the challenge with cyber is that there's not a one-for-one one with what we know in the physical world. Cyber events, cyber attacks have no boundaries. So the damage that we're looking at is a, an interesting uh, perspective right now because uh, to Besma's point, it's, it's going to be interesting to see if they, deny, they want deniability or if actually they do want to take credit because they feel the need to have retaliation against the United States. And so what we'll be looking at are both data-destroying wipers, where they wipe out computers, but we're also seeing activities from Iranian hackers um, called APT-33 or uh, Refined Kitten, where they're looking at our industrial control systems. And they're not just looking at the systems themselves, but they're looking at components of the systems, opportunities for ingress into our critical infrastructure. And so what I'm more concerned about is a widespread attack across critical infrastructure, both on the homeland and in the region, and something that won't necessarily have immediate fatalities, but will cause disruption and destruction uh, that will certainly harm uh, our society. Esma, the, the mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, was saying that if this happens, if there is, if this escalates to a, a full war, it'll be like nothing we've seen before. We sort of share an infrastructure with New York. If New York's attacked, are, are we, are Canadians in trouble? Yeah, so much of our critical infrastructure is intertwined, uh, particularly when we're talking about electricity. Uh, some of the energy sector is certainly uh, connected as well, whether it's uh, gas and oil. Um, all of that is very worrisome, absolutely. And remember here, electricity really is the, uh, the backbone of everything that we do. So you can imagine a blackout scenario is really devastating. But the real key thing is, will the Iranians want to hit us directly? They've tended not to do that, uh, particularly because they don't want to be, again, uh, face the wrath of the United States. The U.S. is still far more competent than the Iranians on conventional, on cyber, on all aspects of war. So it's really about trying to balance that. And what's our red line? Uh, so far, uh, you know, Trump has made it very clear, don't kill American citizens, don't, you know, hit American sites, uh, particularly military and political installations. Does that apply to critical infrastructure? That's the big question mark. We've seen red lines uh, <laughs> stated and crossed before. Uh, Kirsten, what's the timing on this? I mean, it, should everyone be just waiting now, or how long does it take to mount a cyber attack if something like that's going to happen? Well, I think it's important to recognize that Iran will be, this in, be in this for the long game. So I don't think that we'll see anything in 24 hours, 48 hours. It could be weeks, it could be months, it could be years. Uh, this will be a deliberate, calculated attack. I think it's also uh, quite possible that it's sequential or simultaneous. Um, but it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, but I do want to say on the flip side, um, the Iranian capabilities and what we're preparing for is absolutely something the United States has been preparing for for quite a while. Um, certainly since Stuxnet in 2007, when the Iranians uh, started developing their uh, cyber capabilities, we are, uh, have our own tactics and tools and awareness of what they're doing. And so as a nation, we're prepared. It doesn't mean that we're going to be able to prevent everything, but we'll, we are certainly on high alert and certainly ready to respond. Besma, last point. I mean, does Canada get pulled into this? We know that last year the law was changed to allow Canada to participate in cyber attacks, a counter cyber attacks perhaps. Uh, we've just joined this group in NATO that is researching possible future uh, attacks. I mean, will we get drawn in? Will Canada be part of this if it happens? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the reality is that, you know, there's no physical moat anymore separating any country uh, from these kinds of activities. It's all interconnected. This is just the reality of uh, the, the connectivity throughout the world today. We are all uh, looped together, and so much of this critical infrastructure is very much shared with the United States. So we are vulnerable, um, and we have Minister Sajan himself saying that this is something that keeps him awake at night. Cyber war is, uh, frankly, the next frontier. It's far cheaper. Deniability is very high. Uh, and frankly, I think uh, the will and motivation, the technical know-how is in the hands of adversaries. So it is something that is going to be on the rise. Are we prepared for it? We've invested a lot of money into it. There's still a shortage of talent. Uh, it, it's a global hunt for talent, frankly, because it is such high demand and not enough supply. Uh, but nevertheless, pooling our resources in this NATO center is very valuable and welcomed.